Okay, so we're going to review the related rates question. Uh, like this. Okay, so this is the, the opening question in the book. Uh, in section 2.6. So for example, for example, suppose we have the following situation. We have a cone with point down and it's full of water. Okay, a, co a cone is point down and it's full of water and the water is dripping out the tip of the cone because someone came by and just snipped the tip of the cone and so water is leaking out. So how about the water level in the cone? It should be going up or down? Down. Right, good. So then, so then we have a cone. Okay, my artistic impression of a cone here. Okay, and imagine that it's actually not tilted. Okay, so maybe like this. Okay, and then someone came by and just snipped the bottom of it, and water is coming out water is coming out. Okay, so then now what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to sort of make a new version of the cone and I'm going to look at it exactly from the side. Right, so then if, if, if I tilt the cone and look at it from the side then its profile will be exactly a what? A triangle. And it'll be a triangle. So then it'll look like this. Okay, but even better, right, we're assuming that this is a right cone, so then this is more than just a triangle, you know that this is uh, what type of triangle? Starts with I. Isosceles, right? Isosceles. Okay, so then now there's some water level in here, which I will denote with blue. Okay, so maybe I'll make it a thicker line so you can see it. And so that's the water level. Okay, we're going to denote the water level, denote the water level with symbol, what do you want to use for the height of the water? How about H? Okay, good. good. <coughs> we'll call the height of the water H, and then we're going to need another measurement. Okay, so then what do you want to call the radius of the water level? R. Okay, so then now... So, in a question that is about to follow, I would give you some sort of picture like, like this. Okay, so now here's the question. Okay, suppose this cone, the cone, with height uh, 10 and radius uh, something else like 7. So suppose the cone with height 10 and radius 7 has water in it but it's leaking as, as it currently shows. Okay, so then it's leaking at a rate of 2 cubic units per second. Okay, so then find the rate at which the height of the water level is changing. When, uh, so how about at the instant the height is some other number I haven't used here. How about uh, five? Okay, so does everybody understand the question? So then the water is dripping out. The water is dripping out. So then that water level in time is moving what? Up or down? Down, right? And we are supposed to find the rate at which the height of the water level, <laughs> level, is changing when the height is 5. Okay, so then I need some equations and relationships that uh, relate all of these things. 
So what is something, what is something, an equation that I have? So who remembers the volume of a cone? Good. Volume is one third pi r squared h. Volume is pi times one third r squared h. Okay, but there's another equation that we need. We will need another equation before we can go any further. Sorry? Okay, so then let, how about let's continue. Let, let's take the problem from here, and then it'll be more clear what we need. Okay, so then now, the instruction to translate this into a math question, to translate this into a math question, it is find, right, it says find the rate at which the height of the water level is changing. All right, what is the name for that mathematical symbol? Find the HDT. We find the HDT <coughs> when, when what? When H is 5, and we also know that dV dt is what? Not 2. Negative 2. Right, dV dt is negative 2. Why is it negative 2? Because you're losing volume. You're losing volume. Right, so then dv dt is negative. So that means that v is decreasing in time. Okay, so then I have an equation here involving v uh, and r and h, and I want something with about h, uh, dh dt. So what should I do? Differentiate, right? So then d, uh, d dt v is d dt one third pi r squared h. Right, so then how about the left hand side? The left hand side is what? Okay, so then, yes, I, I agree that it's negative two, but I just first want to write dv dt because I want you to realize, in case you haven't already, d dt of v is dv dt. Okay, so then now, in time, as time is progressing, right, R and H, are they both changing? Yes, R and H are both changing in time. They're both changing. So this is the product of two functions. So what will you need to compute the derivative? The product rule, right? You will need to use the product rule. So then this will be 1 third pi, and I'll say R squared derivative H plus one third pi r squared h, like this. So can everyone see the action of the chain rule here? Okay, so then dv dt, dv dt is one third pi. Now what is r squared derivative with respect to t? Yes, two r dr dt h and then plus one third pi r squared and then what do I replace h prime with? dh dt. Okay, so now I perform the derivative operation here and I can see the term that I wanted showed up, right? Which term was the one I wanted? dh dt. Okay, that's the one I want, the one in red. How many, how many of the terms do I have? Right, I have h is 5, so I have this one. I have that one. Uh, I have dv dt. Okay, so then currently at this stage in the solution, which ones do I not have? I don't have r, right, so I don't have this. I don't have this, and I don't have dr dt either. We do? No, 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 I said the rate, so what do we have, right? This, you know, you got to be very careful. What is it that is t 
10, and what is it that is 7? The cone, right? The whole cone. Right, so then this measurement right here is what? 10. This is 10. And this measurement right here, the, the bigger radius, the radius of the cone is what? 7. Right, that's what you have. Okay. <clears throat> So then, we don't have the orange things. Uh, the orange things. Can you see the difference between orange and red on the, on the thing? Not really? OK. Well, so I don't have the orange ones. <laughs> okay, I, have, I don't have R or DRDT. So what? Should we give up? Maybe I forgot to tell you something about this question. Did I, did I leave out some information? No. No, there's another equation here that, that we haven't written down yet. Okay, and it has to do with this picture right here. They are similar triangles, right? Can you see that there is a larger triangle and a smaller triangle within it? And these triangles have all of their three angles are the same, so these triangles are similar, which means that we can make ratios between them. Okay, that is to say, that is to say, that here is an equation, r, right, r over 7 is equal to what? h over 10, according to similar triangles. So can everyone see that? Okay, so then now what I can do is r, ah, that's the one I needed. That's the one I needed. Okay, <coughs> okay. So then if I use that now, so let me make a copy of this. Okay, so now I can have this piece of information. So now I can solve for R and say that R, I need the better one. R is equal to 7 tenths H. So then, now, that further tells me what, I need two things, right? I need R, and I also need DRDT. So then, what is DRDT? DRDT is 7 tenths DHDT. Okay, so then now I can take that equation that I had, Right, that one right there, and I can replace I can replace the R's and DR DTs with seven tenths H and seven tenths DH DT. So then DV DT DV DT is one third pi uh, times two R, and where I'm going to replace that with seven tenths H, and then DR DT I'm going to replace that with seven tenths DH DT. and then h plus one third pi r squared. So I'm going to replace that with 7 tenths h squared the h dt. So now you have an equation with uh, what? One, two, three symbols, dv dt, h, and the h dt, and you have two of those symbols, right? Three variables, I gave you two of them. Can you find the last one? Good, I'm going to leave that to you. Okay, so then now it's just a matter of plugging in. And you get some value that's probably not that excellent because I just made up this question on the spot. And most of the time when I actually make a question, I sort of play with it until it works out to a nicer answer. But here it's probably something like 37 over 4 pi or something like that. <laughs> okay? That negative, right? And why would it be negative? Because because we're looking for we're looking for DHDT. We're looking for DHDT and the water level is going down. So that means that DHDT should be negative. If DHDT was positive, you would be telling me that it's losing volume and as a result the water level is going up. Right? And that would not make any physical sense whatsoever. So any questions about this example? Okay, other questions? Other questions? <coughs> okay, 
So, so we have one thing to mention. So then now we need to continue going over uh, things that are not on the exam, but nevertheless will eventually be on an exam, but not the one that's today. Okay, so then, <clears throat> if you recall, we were in section 3.4, and we were talking about concavity. Okay, and just to review, just to review, here are two sort of canonical pieces of graph that have two different types of concavity. So, this is concave what? Down, like a, like a frown, right? So then, if this piece of graph is a graph of a function f of x, then what will be true about the second derivative here? It will be negative. Okay, and this is concave up, like a cup. <laughs> okay, so then, what will be true about the second derivative here? It will be positive. Okay, so then another remark is that, again, we have these two pieces of graph that are sort of just the canonical versions of concave up and down. I'm going to single out two points, right, that point and that point. So what do those two points have in common? The, deriva the first derivative is zero. Right, so they have horizontal tangents there. Right, so this is, the first derivative is zero. So the first derivative is zero. So I'd like to point out to you that the first derivative is zero. That's an important condition, but it is not enough to tell you if you are at a maximal point, a minimal point, or something that's neither maximal nor minimal. It's not enough. However, take a look at this. This is a max. So the first derivative is zero here, and what is also true about the second derivative? The second derivative is negative. So, if you find a place where the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is negative, then you are certainly at a relative max. Okay. Okay, now a similar story can be said here. The first derivative is zero. What is true about the second derivative? Positive. Okay, if you are, if you find a place where the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is positive, you are certainly at a relative min. Okay, so what about if the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is zero? Then we have nothing to say. You have to use something else, right? This remark makes no conclusion about such cases. So I could make an example where the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is zero, and it is a relative max. I could do the same thing and make it a relative min. I could do the same thing and make it nothing at all. Okay. So this, this thing is called the second derivative test. Okay, so then finally, finally the last bit is that by analogy to what happened with the first derivative test, right? The first derivative test, part of it is saying that if you find a place where the first derivative is, uh, has a, where the function has a critical number, that is to say, the first derivative is zero or undefined, and the function is continuous across that point, and the function changes, the derivative changes sign from positive to negative, right? From increasing to decreasing, then that place is a relative what? max, right? Increasing to decreasing. If you find a critical number and the function is continuous across that critical number and the function decreases and then increases, you have found a relative what? Min. So then, what, what that's telling you is that at a critical number, if the first derivative changes sign, changes S-I-G-N, that's an important phenomenon, right? Because you're changing from increasing to decreasing or from decreasing to increasing, and those places are relative extrema. So the second derivative can also change S-I-G-N, right? From positive to negative, or from negative 
2 positive. That means that what? Not that the slope is changing, but that the concavity is changing. Right? So it changes from, say, concave up to concave down, or concave down to concave up. OK, so then what does this look like when that happens? So for example, right here. So on this piece of graph, can you see a region that is concave down? Yes, I would say, generally speaking, the left side of the graph is concave down, okay, which means that its concavity is negative. That is to say, its second derivative is negative on the left side. Okay, how about is there anywhere where the con concavity is positive? Yes, on the right side. So then this graph is quite smooth, which means that the second derivative must be changing smoothly. So the derivative, the second derivative is negative on the left side of the graph, and it's positive on the right side of the graph. So what must be true? There must be somewhere in the middle where it, the second derivative is 0. Okay. There must be somewhere where the second derivative is 0. So then, where do you think? Where, does, where is the transition between concave down to concave up? Where does it occur? Just with your eyes. Maybe about right here, I would say. So that's about where it changes from concave uh, down to concave up. This place, a sign change in the second derivative is an important place. So what kind of point is this called? This is called a point of inflection. So that is a point of inflection. Now everyone goes through many points of inflection every day. Right? So then for example, if you're driving, if you're driving on the road, okay, and you're going through an S curve, right, the road sort of does a little bit, goes to the right a little bit and to the left a little bit. That has, a, that has a point of inflection in it. So to continue the driving analogy, where is the point of inflection? So let's say that, let's say that I'm first turning to uh, my left. Right, I'm turning, 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 and then now I'm turning to my right, 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 right. Where is the point of inflection with respect to the steering wheel? It's when the steering wheel is exactly straight, is exactly not turned at all, right? So then if the steering wheel is left, that means that I'm turning, right, leftward. Okay, if the steering wheel is right at all, that means I'm turning rightward. So then the point when I'm not turning at all is when the steering wheel is straight up, and that instant is a point of inflection. So left, 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 point of inflection, right, right, right. So now that's what I think, and that's what you're going to start thinking all the time when you drive now. You're going to say, ha, I just went through a point of inflection, right, every time the steering wheel is straight up. OK, maybe you won't do that, but <coughs> that's fine too. So then a point of inflection, this is the definition of a point of inflection for this class, is if 1 f of x has a tangent line at x equal to c. 2, the second derivative evaluated at c is equal to 0. <coughs> 3, the second derivative is continuous at x is c. And 4, the second derivative changes sign sign at x is c, then x equal to c is a point of inflection. Okay, so then, you know, these, these rules, these extra rules, these are like mathematician lawyer rules, okay, because you have to be kind of careful about it, right? So then, for example, if you teleport through a point, 
okay, then that point is not a point of inflection. So here's an example of something that is not a point of inflection. Right, so then how about, how about uh, this function? f of x is 1 over x. f of x is 1 over x. Well, this graph looks like so. Okay, so then tell me, the left side of the graph, that's concave what? Down, concave down. And the right side, that's concave up, right? So it changes from down to up. So that's a point of inflection? No, 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 no. The graph has to be smooth across that point, right? And furthermore, this isn't even a point, right? This is an asymptote. Right? It can't be a point of inflection if it's not first a point. Right? It would be like saying that this... This right here is, uh, I don't know, a black apple. Well, it is black, but it's not an apple, right? So then it couldn't possibly be a black apple. So then this, this cannot be a point of inflection, this point at zero, because it's not a point. Okay, so does everybody see? Let's draw the, have I done an example of a concavity chart? I did one. Good, so then let's sketch the concavity chart for this function. Okay, so then, you would detect that something interesting is happening at x is 0, and then you would say, okay, you would say that it is concave down, like a frown, here, and then concave up, like a cup, here. So then, just looking at the concavity chart, are there any are there any possible points of inflection? Yes, there's a possible point of inflection. Right? There might be one here at zero. Is there actually for this graph? No, there is not. Okay, so does everybody see the way the game goes? So then frequently I'll do that, right? So then I'll give you some kind of I can give you some kind of function that does this. You know, it it has a legitimate point of inflection there. And then something like that, right? So it changes from down to up, and there is a point of inflection here. And then it changes from up to down. Is this a point of inflection? Not a point of inflection because that's an asymptote. Okay, so any questions about the second derivative? Any questions about it? Okay, so then now we do something that is going to feel very much unrelated. <clears throat> but that's all right. So now we're in section 3.5, which is limits at infinity. Okay. So then we have this we already have this notion of limit at a point, and we said for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta, blah, blah, blah. So now we have another thing that we have to do. <coughs> okay, so then specifically, yeah, so horizontal, we don't do vertical asymptotes yet, right? That's so odd to me. Okay, so then, <coughs> here we go. We have a statement. The statement, the limit, as x goes to infinity of f of x is equal to L. So then this looks, this looks just like um, what we did previously, except the difference now is, is that we're saying x is going to infinity. Before, the limit point was always some finite number, c, that we were usually denoting c, like 7 or 8 or whatever. But here, what this is saying is not that we're going to some point C, but rather we are going to go all the way to the right. So one thing that's important to understand is that uh, the number, the symbol infinity, is not a number. It's not. Uh, at least not in this class. So then, the statement this <laughs> means 
the following. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists m greater than zero such that, such that uh, x greater than m implies that the difference between f of x and l in absolute value is less than epsilon. Okay. So, let's sort of try and parse this, what's going on. So, what we're saying is that, okay, we want to know what f does as you go all the way to the right. As you go all the way to the right. Okay, so the claim, the claim here is that it's going to l for some finite number l. And you might think of just, for example, it could be 5. Okay, so we're saying the limit is 5. So what this is saying is that for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists an m such that if x is greater than m, then the difference between f of x and l is less than epsilon. What this is saying is this. It's, again, the same exact adversarial argument. As I, I make the claim to you, or you, no, you make the claim to me, the limit is 5. And I say, is it within 1 of 5? And you say, yes, so, f so long as x is greater than 100. If it's greater than 100, then it's within 1 of 5. And then I say, well, is it within 1 tenth of 5? And then you say, yes, yes, it, but now you have to go all the way to a million, right? As long as x is greater than a million, then it's within a tenth. And if we can, if we can continue this argument forever, if we can continue it forever, then the limit is 5, or L, or whatever it is. So then it helps to look at a picture. The picture is this. Okay, so then I will draw the limit L. Okay, so then that's the limit. Okay, now I'm going to draw two other lines. Okay, and one more line. All right. So then now this this middle line is L. Right? That's the claim that as you go all the way to the right, the function is going to be, in a sense, attracted to this line L. This will be L plus epsilon. And this, if this one's L plus epsilon, then this one down here is L minus epsilon. Good. Okay, this, point, this line right here is X is equal to M. So then now, the statement is saying this. I want to say that as you go all the way to the right, the function is attracted to the red line L. And what we're saying is this. The function is allowed to do anything whatsoever that it wants. Okay, before M. It can do anything, right? Do anything that we want. But after it gets past M, it never goes above or below those two lines. Okay, so to the left of M, maybe it goes above or below those lines. But to the right of M, it stays in between them. And what, what the limit is saying, the limit is saying is that, is that you can make those lines as close to the red line as you want. You can do it. So then, if you make it really, really close, you've got to push M to the right, the pink line. You've got to push it far to the right. But so long as you can push it to the right far enough, that the graph never goes above or below those, then the limit exists. So does everybody understand the geometry here? It's important to understand the geometry. Right, so it's like this. So I give you, you say, you say to me, I think I'm telling you the limit is L. And I say, is it within epsilon of L? Right, so I, for some epsilon, like one one millionth. And you say, yeah, it's within one one millionth. But you just have to push M all the way to, uh, so this way for you. You've just got to push M to a billion. Once, it, once you're past a billion, it's in there. 
it never gets out anymore. And if we can make this, if, I, if you can respond to my challenge, right, my epsilon, I give you an epsilon, and you respond with an M, and you can always do it for any epsilon, then the limit is L. <coughs> Other questions? Okay, good. So, <coughs> that being said, there is uh, actually not that much to do in this section, honestly. <laughs> so, now, let's do review one algebraic thing, a list of algebraic things, and then we'll do some actual examples of computation. So this is um, algebraic properties of infinity. Okay, so then infinity is not a number, but we're going to have a few algebraic properties that allow us to treat it somewhat like a number for the time being. Okay, so then how about this? Uh, let k greater than zero be a constant. then what is k over infinity? It's zero. Right? k over infinity is zero. Okay, how about, how about k divided by negative infinity? It is zero, right? Zero. Okay, how about, how about uh, k multiplied by infinity? What will it be? Infinity, okay? Bec and why, so, why will it be infinity and not, say, negative infinity? Because k is positive, right? k is positive. So, as an example, how about... A further example, how about negative 3 multiplied by infinity? What would this be? Negative infinity. <coughs> okay, how about, how about, I don't know, negative 5 multiplied by negative infinity? What do you think about that? Positive infinity. Good. Okay, so then those are the products and things like this, uh, almost. So now we need... Uh, one more quotient here. How about how about infinity divided by uh, k? What do you think? Infinity divided by k. So if you take infinitely many things and you divide them into evenly into k piles, how big is each pile? Still infinitely big, right? Okay, how about uh, infinity divided by negative 4? Negative infinity, good. Okay, so then now, how about infinity plus infinity? Infinity. How about, uh, how about negative infinity uh, minus infinity? In, not infinity, <laughs> negative infinity. Okay, so now, these things work like you hope, right? I've got carefully gone through and told you the ones that work. Okay, the ones that I care about currently. However, these expressions still have no definition whatsoever. So, infinity over infinity. Not defined. Not defined. Okay, so then, in fact, any combination of signs, not defined. Okay. How about this one? This one's a little more subtle. What about that? Not defined. It is not defined. Okay, and then, you know, I could play the game a little bit. Negative infinity plus infinity. How about that one? 
not defined. Okay, how about this one? This one's a little subtle. Uh, 1 to infinity? No, we will, we'll worry about that later. Okay, so then <coughs> these ones, these ones are not defined. Okay, these ones up here, these are defined. So any question about those expressions? Okay, now for that reason, we can do a few examples and just run through them quite rapidly. How about the limit, the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x squared? What do you think? It is 0, right? Because that would be 1 over infinity squared. Infinity squared is infinity. I didn't write that one down, but you can guess. Right, which is zero, right? That's the definition that we gave it on the previous page. Okay, how about how about something slightly more entertaining? The limit as x goes to infinity of five x plus one over uh, I don't know three minus two x. Okay, so can you plug in the limit point? What if you plug it in? If you plug it in, you would get, right, you would get positive infinity divided by negative infinity. Now, is that defined? No, it's not. No, it's not. So then we're going to have to do some algebraic playing around to see if we can get it. Okay, so then the limit as x goes to infinity of how about this? I can factor out an x in the numerator and the denominator and say that this is x multiplied by 5 plus 1 over x divided by uh, x multiplied by 3 over x minus 2. And now I can cancel the x's. Why can I cancel the x's? When, when would, how about this? I'll ask the opposite question. When would be the only time I could not cancel the x's? when x is 0, right? To cancel means, to cancel an expression like that, to cancel a ratio, means that that expression is exactly equal to 1. That expression is exactly equal to 1, except when x is 0. Now, can we guarantee that we're away from 0? Yeah, we're going to infinity after all, right? I can guarantee that you're greater than 5 trillion, right? You can be as far away from 0 as you wish. So then, this, right, is 5 plus 1 over x divided by 3 over x minus 2. So then now how about these expressions? Can you evaluate each one of them? What is the limit of 5 as x goes to infinity? What does this one go to? 5, right? That's one of the most outstanding things about 5. Okay, so then plus 1 over x. What's the limit of 1 over x? 0. What is the limit of 3 over x? 0. And what is the limit of negative 2? negative 2. So then the limit is 5 over negative 2. Okay, so then for a couple comments. I'm aware that some of you um, have seen procedures like this before, but this procedure that I just showed you is the way that you will use to earn credit in this course. Okay, I'm aware that many of you have taken calculus before and you are aware of something called L'Hopital's Rule. I think it's excellent if you know what that is. If you know what that is. Its use is not allowed until I show it to you. Okay? <clears throat> Good. So then, one more. So, for example, uh, for example, the limit as x goes to uh, negative infinity of x over the square root of x squared plus 1. Okay, so then, so then the numerator, the numerator, if you were to evaluate it, you, it would be negative infinity. Okay, so the denominator, the denominator would be negative infinity squared, which is what? Positive infinity plus 1, which is positive infinity. The square root of positive infinity is positive infinity. So then it would be this, right? So then you cannot simply evaluate. You cannot simply evaluate. So we need to perform some tricks here. Okay, so then 
I'm going to do the following. So then the limit as x goes to negative infinity, and I'll say this is x. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that underneath the square root, I can say that this is x squared multiplied by 1 plus 1 over x. And x squared, uh, 1 over x squared, right? Yeah, 1 over x squared. OK, so then now using the algebraic properties of the square root function, I can say this is the limit as x goes to negative infinity of x divided by the square root of x squared multiplied by the square root of 1 plus 1 over x squared. OK, so then now this is the limit as x goes to negative infinity of x over something, 1 plus 1 over x squared. And now here is where I do battle with your secondary school teacher. What is the square root of x squared? Not x. The square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. Okay. The square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. Okay. Regardless of what your secondary school lied to you about, that the, that the square root of x squared is plus or minus x, they are mistaken. The square root is a function. It cannot give you two values. It cannot. Okay, it has to give you one value because it's a function. So then the question is, is this becomes absolute value of x? Now, in the next line, in the next line, I want to drop the absolute value. And it's a little bit confusing how the absolute value gets dropped. So this is the square root of 1 plus 1 over x squared. So then, what is the absolute value of x? It is negative x. Ah, but wait a minute. Why is it negative x? Hmm, let's think about it. Let's play a game. What is the absolute value of negative 3? You say 3, but I'm going to say it like this. The absolute value of negative 3 is negative negative 3. Okay, now you, you try. What is the absolute value of negative 7? Negative negative 7. So what is the absolute value of x if x is negative? Negative x. The absolute value of x is negative x. So for example, the absolute value of negative 10 is negative negative 10. The absolute value of negative 1 million is negative negative 1 million. We are going to negative infinity. That's where we're going. So the, the symbol x is a negative symbol. It is negative. So its absolute value is negative that symbol, negative x. So then, that being the case, we can say that this is the limit as x goes to negative infinity of negative 1 over the square root of 1 plus 1 over x squared. And all of these things can be evaluated, right? So negative 1 Yes, I canceled this x and that x and x divided by negative x is negative 1. So then this is the square root of 1 plus 0. Okay, which is after arithmetic, negative 1. So the reason for this last happening is this, is that the absolute value of x is x when x is positive, greater than or equal to 0. And it is negative x when x is negative. So which case were we in? This case. Because we're going to negative infinity. See you tonight. <clears throat> no, you don't need to bring anything except a writing utensil and your ticket and a photo ID. <clears throat> Whatever you like. Yes. 
ask you a quick question, Chris for Q? Yes, please do. Um, as soon as I yeah, sure. as soon as I Rattle. turn off this thingy. Yep.